Welcome to Reclaiming the Faith with Phil Baker, a podcast with a mission to reveal what the earliest Christians believed about the core issues facing us today. You can find links to all of Phil's resources at philsbaker.com. Thanks so much for taking the time to listen today and take a moment to share this podcast with your friends. Now, here's Phil. Hey, y'all. This is episode 131 of Reclaiming the Faith. Today, I talk with David Berceau again. This time, we're talking about Emperor Constantine, also known as Constantine the Great. What are the events that led up to his reign? Why did the church become so enamored with him? And how did the church and Christianity as a whole begin to change as a result of what he did? So be sure to check out the show notes for links to all of David Berceau's resources, which I know will be a blessing to you. And if you are blessed by this episode, please consider leaving a positive rating and review on my Apple podcast channel, Reclaiming the Faith, or on Spotify, Google Play, or wherever you're listening to this. I'm blessed to be a part of Omega Frequency along with BDK, and you can find so many of our shows on the Omega Frequency Live YouTube channel. So go ahead and be a subscriber there. All right, well, without any further ado, let's get into episode 131, my interview with David Berceau on Constantine the Great. Well, David Berceau, thank you so much for coming on Reclaiming the Faith again. I really appreciate you taking the time to do this. Happy to be here. Uh, for folks that don't know you, we we did an interview in the past, um, but just want to direct folks to your books and your audio works on uh, scrollpublishing.com. Uh, you've got a chapter in your book, Will the Real Heretics Please Stand Up? That's about the subject matter that we're going to be discussing today, which is about the events that led up to Constantine's ascent and how Christianity began to change afterward. Uh, But you're also doing a series on the Sound Faith YouTube channel about the Book of Romans, which is cool because I believe you're still writing that commentary on Romans. Is that correct? Yeah, it's still a work in progress. Yeah. Oh, man. That's going to be such a blessing to the church. So just to kind of get us rolling, uh, I don't want to start right with Constantine. I want to give a little bit of the context of it. And so... uh, What was the state of Christianity just before the Decian and Valerian persecutions of the mid-third century? Compared to the later church, it was definitely uh, in a very strong condition. Now, compared to the second century, I would say that it had, oh, the spirituality had waned just a bit. I mean, we're now about 200 years since the founding of Christianity, and Christianity had grown remarkably. And, you know, in any movement over centuries, you tend to lose a little bit of the cutting edge. But, I mean, Christians were still standing up faithfully in persecution. You had, a you know, a few more Christians recanted during, like, the Dacian persecution uh, than what you see you know, in, in say the year 150 or something, but still, you know, all in all, the, the church remained uncompromising. What, what effects did those persecutions around in the, in the 250s, what did those have on the health of the church leading up to the Diocletian persecution at the beginning of the fourth century? Uh, I'm hesitating here. I should have reread the, uh, will the real heretics please stand up? Cause I'm trying to think what I said, you know, I wrote that book 32 years ago. <laughs> so <laughs> if what I say doesn't quite conform with that, you'll have, you'll have to excuse me. I'm, I'm going by memory a, a bit here, but my overall impression, at least at this point in time would be the persecution had a cleansing effect on the church. You, you did have a number of lapsed people. It created some issues they were dealing with. When these people wanted to come back into the church, you see some controversies regarding that. But persecution does have a way of cleansing out the the ones who are only half-hearted and, uh, you know, who would have dropped out. And then you had the people who who lapsed, who, you know, denied Christ or something, but then did and wanted to come back in the church. And they were admitted in, but, but usually there was a period of time before they were 
allowed to have communion again. Yeah, yeah. Um, was the church growing more wealthy in those 40 years, basically, between uh, like 260 and 303? Okay, so yeah, what happened was after those persecutions, then you have a period of 400 years or uh, 440 years or so where there was general peace for the Christians. I mean, you know, a few localized persecutions. So yeah, it wasn't so much the persecution that hurt the church. It was that period of peace Hmm. after the persecutions where then, yeah, Christians were more free to be involved in commerce. You you, you do see more luxury, uh, more worldliness. Again, nothing like the post-Nicene church. I mean, we're still comparing it to the second century church. Just in relation to the second century, it was definitely more worldly, uh, more wealth. Uh, people had yeah, gotten used to no persecution. And so they were not ready, I think, spiritually for the uh, huge persecution under Diocletian. Mm. So uh, for those who who don't know, how how did the church view its relationship to the emperor and to the Roman state just prior to the Edict of Milan in 313? Okay, so um, ever since about, oh, 95 A.D., Christianity had been an illegal religion. It was the only illegal religion religion in the whole Roman Empire. The the Romans were um, known for being so incredibly tolerant. I mean, they allowed all kinds of weird Eastern religions. Everybody was allowed except the Christians. So their relationship with the state is they were an illegal sect, even during periods of peace. At any time, they could be erected. Uh, arrested, denounced as a Christian, put to death, tortured, whatever. So the the Christians obeyed Romans 13 on uh, being obedient to the government and paying their taxes. I mean, were model citizens, except that they were Christians, which the Roman emperors didn't like, because for one thing, they would refuse to... Um, acknowledge the emperor as being divine or to um, offer incense up to any of the pagan gods, uh, any of the deceased uh, emperors who are now deified, et et cetera. So for that reason, uh, like I say, they were outlawed, but they respected the the, uh, Caesar, the government, and obeyed it. But they saw this clear distinction. There's two kingdoms. They were part of the kingdom of God, the Roman Empire and the other empires were part of the kingdoms of this world. The uh, the Christians, their kingdom was the kingdom of God. Their ultimate loyalty was to the kingdom of God. That's what they looked at as being their nation. And they looked at all Christians on the world comprising one nation, uh, regardless of whether they were part of the Persian Empire, whether they were barbarians, whatever. So they stayed out of the affairs of government. They obeyed Caesar to the extent they could without violating Christ's laws. But they stayed out of the affairs of government. Uh, I'm going to read you just a couple of representative quotes from Tertullian. Yeah, please do. Okay, so uh, this one, I remember reading it for the first time probably 40 years ago, and it really stuck with me. He said, The Caesars also would have believed on Christ if either the Caesars had not been necessary for the world or if Christians could have been Caesars. It's an interesting quote. He's saying, in other words, yeah, we we need the governments of of this world, (laughs) but you can't be a Caesar and also be a Christian. It's going to violate too many of Christ's teachings. So, um, yeah, the Caesars... For them to become Christians, they would have to resign from being a, um, uh, an emperor. And so, yeah, that was the situation. Uh, okay, so we respect the government. It's a necessary thing established by God, but it is contra to his kingdom, 
And so Christians can't be rulers in both. Another one he, he said, in us, all ardor in the pursuit of glory and honor is dead. So we have no pressing inducement to take part in your public meetings, nor is there anything more entirely foreign to us than affairs of state. So that you know, was one of the things that irritated the, the Roman government and the Roman population is that Christians would not participate in the government and state affairs. They just remained neutral from, from all of that and gave their attention to being citizens of the kingdom of God. And like I say, if they were gifted with leadership, then they were leaders in the church, not leaders in the uh, governments of this world. I guess some people would push back on that and say, well, then they're not being very good citizens. But like we have testimony from Mathetes in a letter to Diognetus that talks about how the Christians not only obey the prescribed laws, but they go beyond them. Like if the if the speed, I mean, this is a silly example, but if the speed limit's 35, they go 33. You know, they're, they're really looking out for, for their neighbor, much more so than the Romans would. Um, you, were ta- you were talking about the Caesars couldn't, become Christians uh, from what Tertullian wrote and others as well talk about things that people would have to give up in baptism. What would a Caesar, what are a couple of things that a Caesar would have to renounce to become a, uh, a follower of Jesus? Yeah. Oh, I wish I had that quote in front of me. I, I should have looked it up. Um, it's also from Tertullian, but he talks about, yeah, whether a Christian can be a government employee you know, not necessarily, well, more like being a magistrate. I mean, he, yeah, he says the lower levels, okay, no, no problem. It's not a sin to work for the government, but okay, like a higher office, like magistrate, he says, okay, let's say you're going to do this. Um, You're not going to uh, announce any holidays to pagan gods. You're not going to participate in them. Uh, You're not going to take any oaths. You're not going to torture anybody. You're not going to put anyone to death. He starts going through the list of all the things you would have to do just to be an ordinary magistrate. And he said, you know, a Christian can't do those things. He wasn't denying Caesar the right to punish criminals or to put criminals to death even. But, yeah, this violated the laws of the kingdom of God. And so, yeah, it just didn't work trying to be uh, even a lower ruler, like like a magistrate, which would not have been a particularly high office. But then when you get up to the top, you're waging wars. Um, I think every Caesar that ever lived, probably just about every king and queen in the Middle Ages, were continually putting rivals to death. Uh, sometimes the books will call it murder. Usually they they do, you know. One of your questions was Constantine murdering his son and his wife and all that. Yeah, anyone that you suspected of maybe being a rival um, to your throne, that maybe they're going to try to oust you or something. Yeah, the standard practice was you you have them put to death, you, you know, um, either just murdered or some trumped up charge and and you have them executed officially but either way i mean you just have blood on your hands trying to trying to be a caesar in any any period of the roman empire yeah so let's get into uh constantine a little bit in 312 he there's a civil war basically in rome and you have constantine facing maxentius i believe um i believe that's his name i'm sorry uh-huh yeah. yes you got it right uh they're at the milvian bridge and um before that happens, we're told from uh, Lactantius and uh, later Eusebius that Constantine sees a vision of of a Cairo and told he's told to paint this on the shields of his uh, soldiers by this sign conquer. And uh, so he he won. It seems like whatever the vi- the vision was, it worked. Um, what do you think happened to Constantine there on the Milvian Bridge? Because, and, and I ask that because he had a similar vision, according to some of the, the pagan writers. He had a similar vision earlier in his life before a battle where the god Apollo showed up to him, who's like the Greek god who kind of represents the sun. 
at least to some people. And I just find that interesting. I'm sorry for the long setup, but you know, Constantine evidently like never renounced his uh, his ties to his buddy Sol Invictus, um, and he remains the the Pontifex Maximus. That title even after his baptism. So I'm just curious, like, wh- what do you think happened? Was that from God, that sign on the Milvian Bridge, that vision? Was it, uh, was it a made-up story? Was it a hallucination? Was it like uh, Paul talks about Satan coming as an angel of light? What do you think happened? Yeah, <laughs> yeah we don't know. You know. All of those are, are you know, uh, possibilities. I certainly don't think it's from God. I would cross that off as a possibility. Uh, Any of the others are possible. My own personal feeling is that it's a made up story. Uh, I mean, not made up by Lactantius, but made up by by Constantine. Uh, And I'll tell you, I mean, like you say, you mentioned he supposedly had a vision um, before that in another battle. The last few years, I've been looking for dry things to read at night to go to sleep. And so I've been reading a lot of the biographies of uh, uh, ancient uh, Romans and, uh, you know, people like Alexander the Great and and that. And it is amazing. I I mean, it it stood out because of of being aware of the situation with Constantine. It's just amazing how many of them had dreams the night before some battle. And, yeah, they had this vision of this happening and, and all of that. And either all of those are lies, which I think is quite possible that that became, you know, a standard thing, you know, that uh, you had to have had a, a dream from a God, you know, that that showed this was uh, this victory was ordained by the gods or something. Or these people had vivid imaginations. I don't know, but it is certainly not something uncommon to relate that before some victorious battle that. Whoever it was, I think Caesar Augustus had one, you know, more than one himself. Uh, that yeah, they had these dreams of you know a god appearing to them or or something like this. So uh, it could be Satan or or you know demonic, definitely. But I'm inclined to believe, yeah, it's a story Constantine made up. I don't think, and you can correct me on this. Um, Bill, I don't think it's in Eusebius's history of the church. Uh, it's in his life of Constantine, which was written later. So it makes me wonder why he omitted such a key event in his, you know, earlier work on the history of the church where he talks about, you know, Constantine. So it makes me think it's something that Constantine spun later. And, and, in his uh, life of Constantine, he does not mention about putting this on the shields. And, and I think that's definitely a later embellishment. It just seems like a story that just keeps growing. And one of the telltale things, when I was in Rome, um, it must have been 2001, and I went to the, we were in Rome, and I went to the Arch of Constantine. And I was very curious. I want to see, because I had these doubts, I want to see the shields it had a frieze there and depicting the battle at the Milvian Bridge. And I wanted to see if those shields and Constantine's armies had a cross on them or a Cairo or anything. No. no. Plain shields. And you can find it now on the internet. Just look up Arch of Constantine and you can get a, a very clear picture of that scene of the Milvian Bridge, the battle there. And, and the shields really stand out on Constantine's army, and they're just plain shields. So, And that was uh, made, I think, in um, 315 or something, very shortly after. So if that had really happened, surely they would have put that there. That would have been such a significant thing that whoever did the art, I mean, that would have been one of the key features, and it's not there. So I think that part, anyway, is totally fictitious. I doubt the dream... I certainly think, do not think it was from God that he would ever tell someone to uh, take the cross or chi- the Cairo, either one, and yeah, kill your enemies, the very thing Jesus told us not to do. So why do you think the, the bishops began to believe that Constantine had converted 
to Christianity? Okay. And, and that question is a little complicated because yeah. as, as, as you know, and I think you have a later question on it, he was not baptized until just a few days before he died. So he was never part of the church. He would not have, I don't think, called himself a Christian. Um, but I do think he believed the God of the Christians gave him the victory. Uh, that's my guess. Um, he certainly was inclined towards Christianity. His mother was a Christian. And Lactantius had been one of his tutors, I, I believe. Yeah. And so he had that influence. His father had been very tolerant of the Christians, had not persecuted them. So he did have that favorable attitude. And yeah, we none of us know what was going on in, in his mind. Now, I, I reject what Gibbons says that, oh, he was looking at Christianity as a way to unite his empire. I don't think that's very likely. I think he honestly believed the God of Christianity had given him his victories. But um, yeah, he's a pagan. I mean, he, he's, he's looking at things the same way the Caesars before him had looked at it. You know, Apollo gave him the victory or this God or that God, you, you know. Um, the church, yeah, I, I try to put myself in their shoes. It's easy to criticize when you're not in someone else's shoes. So they've had this, you know, 40 years or whatever of peace. Uh, persecution is kind of out of their minds. It's like us in the United States. And boy, suddenly it's a empire-wide persecution. I mean, everybody is affected. Uh, people are being put to death, tortured. Uh, the Bibles are supposed to be burned and yeah, all, all kinds of things happening. It really caught the people, I think, spiritually unaware. And um. Yeah, there were little laughs. There were a lot of faithful martyrs in that. Yeah, and, and then here comes this uh, emperor and says, we're going to give Christianity, we're going to make it legal. You're on the same footing as everyone else. You're not going to be persecuted anymore. I mean, yeah, of course, you, you, I mean, <laughs> you would have high regard for him. I mean, you know, you would get, it'd be easy to get caught up in that. And then when he continues to have victories, if my recollection is correct, I don't think Constantine ever lost a battle his entire life. Mm. And um, so, yeah, it's, it's easy to think, hey, God is changing the rules. Any of us can get caught up in that. And I think it stands as a great lesson. OK, look what happened when they thought God had changed the rules, that things are different now, that, yeah, the church ended up compromising in many, many areas and it led to, you know, what eventually became the Roman Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church. And, yeah, a, a pretty big departure from what primitive Christianity had been. Yeah, so let's talk about that a little bit. How did some of the Christian, and it's obviously it's not all Christian leaders because some did not think this was a good thing. But how did a lot of those Christian leaders respond to Constantine's supposed conversion? Yeah, as you said, they accepted the benefits. Now, I mean, you know, we accept certain benefits. I mean, yeah. like tax exemption for our churches. I don't know that that's wrong. Right. Um, if there's no strings attached, and right now there's no strings attached. Now, that could change. And I think, yeah, we need to not get too comfortable with that. But every other religion, the priests or ministers were given exemption from taxes. So now that Christianity was made a legal religion, well, they the clergy were exempt from taxes. I mean, I don't know if there's anything wrong with that. All of the other religions, the state paid salaries to the priests. The reasoning was the more gods that we have on our side in Rome, the more likely the Roman Empire is going to prevail. And since it did prevail, it seemed to kind of, uh, substantiate that this theory worked, you know, hey, be nice to all the different gods, and then all the gods will want the Romans to prevail. Now, somehow they felt like Christians were an exception, and they weren't nice to them, but yeah, so Constantine is thinking, okay, we'll include the Christians on this too, and um, 
So since all the other ministers get paid and get tax exemption, we'll do the same with, with the Christians. I think that's where they should have drawn the line. Like, no, um, we're not going to accept pay from, from the government. Hmm. But again, I don't think he put any strings with it. It's just the strings that get attached, you know, w- without anyone necessarily intending it. You become dependent on that. And then hmm. you're afraid to speak out against the emperor. He's been so nice to you. He's rebuilt all of these churches that had been destroyed in the persecution. So, yeah, it kind of affects you from wanting to say anything negative when he, when he's been giving you all of these benefits. So, yeah, pretty soon you just start going along with things that in the past you would have said, no, a Christian can't do this. What about theologically? Did you Do we see any, um, you know, slow changes theologically, um, maybe in the way Christians view, uh, well, emperors um, being saved and um, different things like that, maybe eschatology. Yeah, they started losing that doctrine of the two kingdoms. Hmm. It's like, okay, yeah, in the past, uh, there were the two kingdoms, and the kingdom of God was separate, but they started going back to the Old Testament examples. They're saying, you know, back then, the kingdom of God was an earthly kingdom, and, and God did work with the kings. And, and so, yeah, maybe that was just a period of test and persecution for 300 years, and now God is blessing us because we've been faithful to him. And now, yeah, the, his kingdom is going to be part of the kingdoms of this world, and will rule the people of this world, and this will be a benefit to the whole world. And, you know, that kind of thinking on the surface makes sense. I mean, obviously, I reject that, and and I see where it it led things. But, again, trying to put myself in their shoes, you know, it looks like the rules have changed. And so maybe this doctrine of the two kingdoms wasn't a permanent doctrine. Maybe, yeah, that was for a time, and now the times have changed. And we're getting blessings um, you know, God is giving us blessings that he didn't give the church in the first and second and uh, third centuries. So, yeah, that that thinking began to pervade the church. And I haven't found any of the major um, Christian leaders stand up to that. Mm. The, people that the leaders that people praise like Athanasius and, and Ambrose and all those people, yeah, nobody is objecting. They're, they're just getting sucked in with it, and and they're benefiting, of course. Um, one of the things that happened was because Constantine, even though he didn't make Christianity the official religion of the state, he always allowed, you know, any religion, um, he favored Christians. Most of his close advisors were Christians. Um, and so if you wanted to climb up the ladder politically and socially, It helped you to become a Christian. You know, if you wanted to be the next magistrate or or the next whatever. Yeah, if you were a Christian, that was going to help a whole lot. So, and likewise, uh, people like Athanasius, I mean, he was probably the second most powerful individual in the whole empire. Mm. Uh, These bishops over large churches like Alexandria and Rome yeah, I mean, they they suddenly had enormous influence and, and power. And yeah, power is a corrupting thing, and it's hard to let go of it once you have it. Mm. So what effects did the state's favorable outlook uh, on Christians begin to have on Christian gatherings in particular? Obviously, like their gatherings were pretty modest at first, uh, before these changes so again when a religion is being persecuted you you don't get a lot of lukewarm people Uh, i mean you might have the children of christians may not grow up with the same zeal as their parents that that often happens but you're not going to get a lot of converts who are are wishy-washy when they know at any moment they could be denounced and arrested and tortured and put to death. I mean, 
So, yeah, Christianity grew, but it was people who counted the cost, who knew what was going to be involved. But then after Constantine, and it became um, a social asset to be a Christian, yeah, then you just start having all of these half-converted pagans flocking into the church. And Constantine, you know, uh, sponsored, used state money to build these giant church buildings to rival the pagan temples. And so, yeah, people wanted to go there. It was the in religion now uh, to be part of. And that, that doesn't help Christianity when you have a bunch of lukewarm, uh, semi-converted people bloating the church. And, and that's exactly what happened in the fourth century. Do you see a move in the uh, time of exhortation in those gatherings? Do you see a move toward more of like a Greek um, oratory version of presenting the word rather than more of a, a very simple, here's what the scripture says and an interaction between people? I, I, I don't know. You know, I read the sermons from the 300s and say in general, I, I don't find fault with, with most of them. Um, my favorite one and uh, would be John Chrysostom. Also, some people say Chrysostom, kind of an anglicized version of his name. Um, he sticks very close to the word. I mean, we have his sermons because people took them down in shorthand. And so, you know, he just taught um, going verse by verse through books of the Bible, expository teaching. And, you know, he sticks. It's not flowery language. He's called... Uh, Chrysostom, it wasn't his the name he was born with. It was actually years, centuries after he was dead that somebody reading his sermons gave him that name, but not because he's particularly eloquent. He uses good Greek, but it's he, he's a master expositor. Hmm. And nearly all of his sermons at the end, then he gets into um, application, even if it's a book. That's largely dealing with theology like Hebrews or Romans. Uh, he'll nevertheless, and sometimes the biggest part of his sermon will be the exhortation, particularly uh, preaching to the rich, uh, of getting you know rid of their uh, riches, of helping the poor, of not living in luxury. So I think the preaching probably, at least during the 300s, was at a pretty good level. I, I, I like to say the sermons I've read, I cannot find fault with, but it also is revealing the things that Chrysostom is saying. It's obviously he's talking to an audience that live almost like the pagan Romans, not in immorality per se, not in pagan worship, but I mean, they're all caught up in the um, Roman games, in, in the uh, sports sporting contest, the chariot races, in fashion, in uh, the theater, and, and all that sort of stuff. It's a different audience than the sermons in the second century. So uh, moving forward uh, 15 years or so from the Milvian Bridge, how did the church respond to Constantine having his son uh, Crispus and one of his wives, Faustus, murdered? And... Uh, how would that differ from how the church would have handled a Christian leader doing those things in the second century? Yeah, I have not found a word of criticism from anybody. Yeah, They seem to have just adopted a policy of looking the way. Of course, he was not a baptized Christian, so they could, you know, maybe, you know, oh, okay. But then it didn't change when the emperors were baptized Christians. Yeah, there was a dual standard, a double standard. If you're an emperor, yeah, it's okay to murder rivals. I think somebody had suggested his son was disloyal to him and uh, was maybe trying to usurp the throne or something like that is why he had him murdered. And then we don't know for sure on his wife. One of the theories, it wasn't her son, that she maybe was the one who started the whole rumors and all that. And he eventually realized, yeah, she had led him to murder his son, you know, unnecessarily. So he had her put to death, but whatever, 
it's murdered, yeah. <laughs> whatever the reasons are. The church said nothing. I mean, these people who are supposed to be so great, like Athanasius, uh, nothing. They're they're just silent. In contrast, in the mid uh, 200s, you had an emperor, Philip the Arabian. Um, Eusebius says he was reported to be a Christian. He definitely had interest in the Christianity. And Eusebi- Eusebius relates an account where uh, during the Easter vigil, they didn't call it Easter, uh, the Paschal vid- vigil would have been their, their term. Uh, he tried to come into the church to pray. And the bishop stopped him and said, you know, you're not going to come in and pray with the faithful. I mean, you can be with the uh, the, the sinners, the ones, you know, who are repenting, uh, the ones under church discipline, but you're not going to come in and, you know, and pray with the faithful. And, and that is so neat, you know, that this is the emperor who could have turned around and started persecuting them as a result of that and put the bishop to death. But it, it, from the account, it sounds like Philip uh, acquiesced to that. But they didn't do that with with Constantine. Yeah, a totally different world. Mm. Why do you think Constantine waited until he just a few days before he died uh, to get baptized? I, I think he honestly realized, as Tertullian said, you know, you can't be a Caesar and be a Christian both. And uh, he knew there would be too much blood on his hands. Uh, to maintain his position as as emperor, there was the battle there against Maxentius, and then uh, Licinius later, who was at first his ally, and then you know he fights him. So it's endless uh, bloodshed, and yeah, he wasn't going to do away with torture and and that sort of stuff. Back then, they thought that was the only way to run a government. You know, how do you find out who the criminals are unless you you know get one of them and torture them and make them reveal everything. So it's interesting. I, I wanted to just read this, a very short passage. This is in Eusebius's Life of Constantine. It's chapter 62. And this is Constantine. It's maybe something he wrote down. If not, it's something somebody um, related. And this is what he said uh, right at the time he's asking to be, to be baptized. He said, This is Constantine. The time is arrived, which I have long hoped for with an earnest desire and prayer that I might obtain the salvation of God. So he he did not view himself as being saved during all those years. The hour has come in which I too may have the blessing of that seal, talking about baptism, which confers immortality. The hour in which I may receive the seal of salvation. I had thought to do this in the waters of the river Jordan, wherein our Savior, for our example, ordered to have been baptized. But God, who knows what is expedient for us, is pleased that I should receive this blessing here. He's in the city of Nicomedia, and he's in failing health. Be it so, then, without delay, for should it be his will, who is Lord of life and death, that my existence here should be prolonged, and that I should be destined henceforth to associate with the people of God and unite with them in prayer, As a member of his church, I will prescribe to myself from this time such a course of life as befits his service. So he realized my course of life is not fitting for service to Christ. So in some ways, I have to honor him that he recognized, yeah, this is no life for a Christian. Of course, I don't know that God accepts deathbed conversions when they're a planned thing. In other words, I'm going to live wicked until the last moment, and then I'll get baptized. I don't know. I can't judge Constantine's heart, and I'll leave that in God's hands. But it is a telltale testimony that, yeah, now I will start living (laughs) the life of a Christian. Obviously, he wasn't before. And yeah, the, the church should have been a lot more firm with him. But I'm sure they were afraid if we anger him, well, we'll not only lose our privileges, but we may have persecution again. You know, some authors and commentators about that are speaking about or writing about Constantine delaying his baptism for 25 years act like that was a common thing for Christianity 
in the you know, early fourth century or even before that. It doesn't seem that that's common in the way that I read things. H- how do you how do you feel about that? You know, it's hard to know. There are examples, and there are examples of Christians who live very godly lives, and I'm puzzled that they got baptized, you know, on their deathbed. It came from this wrong teaching. But back to your first question, I don't know how, you know, if that was the majority, if that was a small minority that we just happen to have a record of their life. Nobody knows the answer to that. We, we just don't know. Yeah. But there was a, a view. And of course, they viewed baptism as something more than a symbol. It was sort of the seal of salvation. We needed to have true conversion before and, and faith in the blood of Christ. But that was instead of going up and having an altar call, you went and got baptized like you see there in the book of Acts. That was the sealing uh, event. But there was this teaching held by some that after baptism, you're allowed only one major stumble, you know, like committing sexual immorality or murder or something like that. You get one, you know, you can have one stumble and that's it. Now, not taught that, but it was, it was a view out there. Sure. So if you held to that view, it's like, Ooh, boy, <laughs> I, might, I might better wait because, you know, any of us could stumble and, and, um, but yeah, it's a terrible thing to, yeah, then end up, you're not saved. I mean, they would not have viewed themselves as saved. And, and, you know, that is not the example we have in Acts of people saying, oh, well, yeah, let's wait until, we're near our deathbed. No, they got baptized immediately uh, as soon as they were converted. So it's not a godly practice. Some of the people, like I say, seem to have been godly people who did it, but most were probably like Constantine who realized, yeah, my life doesn't measure up and I can manipulate God. Uh, In other words, I'll live this ungodly life and then get baptized right at the end. Of course, you don't know when you're going to die. So that's a very dangerous course. But again, I don't know if God accepts that. I I mean, to me, if I were God, I don't think I would be pleased with that kind of action. Oh, okay. You're not going to live by my teachings, but you think you're going to slip in at the last moment on a technicality. So, yeah. Hmm. So after Constantine dies, what are some ways that Christianity began to change following his, his death and his reign? I guess we could hit like Theodosius and then even go further into like 412 area with Augustine. Like there's a lot, I'm sure. Yeah, it is. Well, it is constant downhill from there. I mean, first of all, we didn't get into it today, but I've talked to my books about the turning, getting so focused on theology and um, the controversy uh that Nicaea was supposed to settle the Arian controversy. It it didn't settle it. And unfortunately, it's really hard to know reading the account of who was a heretic and who wasn't, because unless you accepted the Nicene Creed, then people like Athanasius labeled you as an Arian. And you may have held to a perfectly orthodox view of Christ, but the, the uh, Nicene Creed required you to use the word homoousian, which is not a biblical word. And so some people just, hey, I'm not going to use that creed, but I, I hold to what the church has always believed. Well, sorry, you're an Arian. I mean, you know, no, either you accept it or you're an Arian. So you have this constant battle going on between the so-called Arians and the, the Nicene party. And so some of the emperors, like some of Constantine's sons, were so-called Arians. I, I don't know if they really believed what Arius did. I, you know, it's hard to know because, like I say, everyone's getting labeled that. And so, yeah, you you end up with all this persecution back and forth, and wars, and, and it gets worse and worse. You get to Theodosius and and some of the others. I mean, they're just it's cause it's just like it was in the pagan days of the two hundreds. Constant civil war. This emperor fighting this em- this other emperor, because uh, Constantine 
divided his empire among his sons. And so, you know, they're fighting each other. And then that that just continued on. There'd be a period where you'd have one emperor, but then he would die. And the next thing you know, it'd be this rivalry again and, and all this bloodshed. Um, yeah, there is no difference when you get to the year 400. The fact that they're called Christians, all it meant was they hold to a certain doctrinal belief. But those emperors behave no differently than than the emperors in, like I say, the second century, the first century. Most of them weren't as wicked as, say, Nero. But, yeah, an awful lot of them had concubines and, you know, all kinds of things like that. Well, just wrapping things up, um, it seems like when there's a fear of persecution— the church can often or has often turned to the government as basically it's, it's God as its deliverer and, uh, and maybe not the current one, but maybe if we could get the right person in charge, then we would be saved, you know, that kind of an idea. Um, so just with that kind of in, in mind, what do you have any final words of advice or exer- exhortation for today's church based on the stuff we've been talking about? Yeah, so we've really seen this in the last um, 10 years of something, you know, very similar, although it's been going on a long time. But, you know, we had President Trump, who was very um, nice to Christians. I I mean, you know, um, both in legislation and intent, I think he wanted to bless the churches. He wanted to bless Christians. And, yeah, naturally, you appreciate a president who is, you know, not not passing, you know, ungodly laws and, and that sort of thing. But Christians, what happened? I mean, major Christian leaders, they blinded themselves to the ungodly part of Donald Trump. I mean— you know, I don't know where he stands with with God. Certainly, his prior life has not been a godly one. You know, I, I can't speak right right now into things, but you know, his whole character is not the character of what a Christian should be. He, he was very brash, very uh, uh, boisterous. You know, headstrong. I mean, nothing like the qualities, the meekness that Christ taught. And, and Christians should have spoken out about these things, Christian leaders. Hey, we appreciate that, that you know, you're friendly to the churches and you're supportive, but, you know, we need to speak into your life. I mean, you, you're claiming to be a Christian and look at some of the things you're doing. They didn't do that. I mean, man, they just set him up like, I mean, there were pictures. I saw one picture um, where Trump is signing some legislation and Christ is right there holding the pen. <laughs> You've seen that one. And it's like, come on, you know? Yeah. And this made Bible-believing Christians, it made all of us look really dumb in the eyes of the world. It's like, oh, so you hold this guy up as the model of Christianity. Right. And that never yeah. happened. And Christians even then getting involved in violence, you know, to uh, seize the Capitol and, and, and that kind of thing. I don't, hopefully most of those weren't professing Christians, but I'm sure there were many professing Christians among that. Yeah, this is just getting back to the days of Constantine. We're losing, we lose sight of Christ's teachings because we have somebody who um, wants to bless the churches. And we've had a lot of presidents who've been very anti Christian uh, in their attitude. And yeah, it, it, like I say, it was nice to have somebody who you felt like was on your side. That's very dangerous then. It, it, yeah, you're not on your guard, and and Christian leaders weren't. They were doing the same thing that they had done back in the days of Constantine, of just, yeah, we'll close your our eyes to the things you're doing that are wrong because you're blessing the churches. All alone here on my hands and knees Pleading for this cup to pass from me Answer comes as blood from forehead falls I can't escape the firing squad Here I am amongst the chains and fists I always knew that it would come 
they're gonna have a fear at all I can't escape the firing squad But I'll sing your great love forevermore I'll tell them your great faithfulness, oh Lord And I am sure, just look around and you can see the floor They pierce and taunt and they divide my clothes their only hope to have a change of heart I can't escape the firing squad I ain't running from the firing squad